Hi, everyone joining us. My name is Sunny Mullen. I am the Outreach Manager with Help Hope Live, and we are joined today for one of our wonderful HOPE Talks with the United Spinal Association in conjunction with Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month, which is September. So we are very happy to have this HOPE Talk about a day in the life with spinal cord injury. We are going to let a few more people get settled into the Zoom room, and then we'll be on our way. Uh, just some housekeeping. We do have the chat function that we are moderating. So please, if you have conversation going on, you can go there. If you have any specific questions for our panelists, you can go to our Q&A section so that it's separate from the chat and we can be sure to answer those at the end of the presentation. So we're gonna give it another minute or two and then we will get started with our presentation. Thank you all so much. Okay, I think we're gonna just get started. People can join us as they come in. As I said, my name is Sunny Mullen and I am with Help Hope Live. And we are here today with our HOPE Talk with United Spinal Association in conjunction with Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month being September. So we are very happy to be joined by two wonderful gentlemen working with United Spinal, Bill Fertig and Jose Hernandez. Uh, and they are going to be talking to us about a day in the life of a spinal cord injury, of, of those living with a spinal cord injury and their experiences, the, the equipment they use, how they get in and out of their cars, and really here to answer any questions that you might have related to your spinal cord injury and what you might ne need advice on. So again, just some housekeeping. We have our chat function for the conversation that you might want to keep up with other attendees. We have our Q&A section that you can write down all your questions for the panelists. And also just wanna put it out there that Help Hope Live, we are a national nonprofit that assists individuals to fundraise in their communities for all of their medical expenses and related costs. So really any of the equipment that Bill and Jose will be talking about today that's related to their mobility needs and their spinal cord injury, we would be able to help you fundraise toward. So we'll get to that again toward the end of the presentation, but I just appreciate you being here today. And another caveat, really just a disclaimer, is that any of the equipment that they are speaking on is from their experiences with that equipment. So we're not here to tell you to pick one piece over the other, but this is purely off their experience and we are lucky to have them here to talk about their experiences. So with that, I will let them take it from here and introduce themselves and really let's just get this Hope Talk on the road. So Bill, I think you're up first if you wanna introduce yourself to our community here. I am. Thank you so much, Sonny, for the invitation for Jose and I to present to your audience. We know well how Help Hope Live serves the spinal cord injury community um, for the unmet, uh, uninsured needs that, that we recognize. A little bit of uh, history about myself. Uh, there, there's a couple bullets up there. I, I, I live with uh, paraplegia for 22 years uh, from a motorcycle accident. And um, I've, I've had the, the honor and uh, privilege to work for United Spinal Association for the last 16 years. Um, United Spinal and its precursors, um, pre-merger. And um, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be able to speak to people daily about, you know, their needs and, and Jose and I help guide people on their pathways. Jose? You are muted, Jose. Second yep, presentation of the day, people. He, he's, he's getting it in all right. <laughs> I definitely realized that I was like, oh, it came up all across the screen. <laughs> So hello everyone, my name is Jose Hernandez. I'm the uh, New York City Advocacy Coordinator for United Spinal Association. I'm also the president of its New York City chapter. I sustained a C5 spinal cord injury due to a diving accident um, nearly 20, well, a little over 26 years ago. So that's just me. And Bill, you wanna run through the statistics right quick? Sure, Jose. You know, one of the things that we provide to, to people um, 
uh, you know, the questions that come into the resource center are many and varied. Um, there's probably no question, you know, that we haven't gotten, and and then and then then there's that unique one that does sneak in. But you know, one of the things that's very helpful, for instance, if uh, if there's a legal team working with someone with a, a recent injury, is being able to cite statistical facts from uh, that are gathered together from all the model systems over a period of 40 years and uh, are uh, compiled by the National Statistical Center located at University of Alabama, Birmingham. And those are just a couple of the fast uh, stats as of uh, 2021, uh, 17,000 uh, spinal cord injuries annually. And uh, in the archive version, there'll be more uh, details available in the facts at a glance page. In, the, in our spinal network, uh, we have a very broad reach. As you can see, 49 chapters currently uh, divided into six regions geographically. Jose, I believe you're um, one of the um, coordinators, regional coordinators for the Northeast region in New York and um, 100, 196 affiliated support groups. One word about the support groups, you know, we were pretty proud of our building support group network that met face-to-face -face, uh, back before pandemic days, but, you know, you still had to be sort of close to one of those groups to be able to make it there. And sometimes folks had transportation challenges to get to those meetings. Now with the pandemic, the silver lining is we can all meet by Zoom or MS Teams uh, from wherever we are. So we now have at the bottom of our homepage, unitedspinal.org, a recurring list of 31 different uh, virtual peer support groups for any one month. Uh, men's group, women's group, new injury group, which is obviously gonna be very important to those newly injured who might be the people that are you know, accessing fundraising not long after their injury. And uh, some of the other uh, stats, um, we have 56,000 individual members and uh, 105 hospitals or therapy programs. I think we can move on. Well, I just wanna add a little bit to that and say that you know peer mentorship is definitely the way to move forward in your, with your disability and even to do some product research and uh, of the items that we're gonna be talking about you know, here shortly. You know, I, we're only one voice and, you know, you can access, you know, 58,000 members if, you know, you really look in, into it. So we're going to jump right into it and, you know, talk about a little bit of the high tech needs for computer input devices. So I'm a high level quadriplegic. I'm a C5, like I stated earlier, and I use uh, myself something similar to the trackball that's in the middle with the red ball. But for those who have higher level injuries uh, and don't have the ability to move their arms, they might have to use something like the sip and puff input devices here. One of them is the JALS 3 um, and the other one is the Quad Joy. Those devices aren't cheap and <laughs> you're going to need to fundraise for So you're somewhere. saying we can help you fundraise for those. Yeah. Yep. On average. Yeah, absolutely. On average, the Joust or the um quad joy i think they range anywhere from 13 to 1500 dollars just for the base model if you want any of the other attachments or uh input devices that they sometimes require to be able to use for multiple platforms you're going to need to do add-ons so that, that bill can go up uh the trackball mouse is something simple um it's you know a hundred dollars buy it off of amazon and it works for me for some of the individuals, they might like trackpads and, you know, they can use it with a stylus that I'm holding or a different typing aid that has, you know, a stylus in the tip of it. You know, these are simple typing aids. You have uh, one that goes on your hand that allow you to hit the keys one by one or a mouse stick for someone that uses like the sip and puff device. Me for typing large documents, I use Dragon, naturally speaking. I've been using it since the early 2000s. Uh, my vocational rehab um, counselor recommended it 
to me and help me get it set up. It's one of the more expensive options out there, ranging anywhere from $150 to $300, if, or if not more, if you want the professional version, but it's a very good option. I like that you do note that it's not free. <laughs> it's not free. Yeah. <laughs> I state that because there are free options out there. Okay, okay. So this is just an example of me, which is not working. One second, I know why. And I'm gonna do this again, I'm sorry, everyone. Yeah, we can help you. We can help you guys fundraise for all of these equipment. Um, and as Bill and Jose are saying, these are specific to them. But I've seen a lot of different people using all different types of equipment. And as we can let Jose share with us now, especially um, how he uses the dragon. Well, it looks like the video is still not working. Okay, that's um, all right. Security that's settings. All right. These things happen. But. Um, this would normally be me um, giving an example of uh, using the actual dragon itself. You know, I would say wake up and uh, just a simple phrase I was saying was, this is me using dragon, naturally speaking. And the voice dictation program actually picks it up and plays it. So for a free option, you can go and use Google Documents. It's free, it's fairly accurate. Everyone has the Google Assistant. Well, not everyone, we have iPhone <laughs> users, but um, those who have uh, an Android phone have the Google Assistant at their fingertips or some kind of voice assistant. And they have a lot of uh, knowledge. Um, so it needs a little more input from someone that's uh, outside, like, you know, moving things around and getting it set up. But once it's set up, you're good to go. Again, I would have shown you an example, but unfortunately the videos for some reason aren't playing. And um, I don't know why. <laughs> but this again would be an example of me using the uh, Google Voice. There are other options out there, like the one that comes integrated with Windows, but I've never had really any good success trying to use that one. I guess I never gave it the real time uh, it needed for training, but I know that the Dragon Naturally Speaking and the Google Voice are fairly accurate. Bill? Thanks, Jose. Um... You know, there's a depiction here of some uh, of the more popular power assist devices for uh, manual wheelchairs. Um, a lot of folks uh, recognize that it's quite an advantage to have a manual wheelchair for purposes of being able to pop it into a car trunk and, and for a lot of other reasons. And, uh, and yet, uh, if you're going a long way or uh, we've come to learn at, at major events with a sea of uh, carpet uh, in a convention center that, um, you know, propelling through carpet is, is a slog for a manual wheelchair user. Uh, or, or for a high functioning quad that can use a manual chair but needs a little extra booth, um, a little extra boost, a little extra power. You have the um, smart drive attachment for the rear just down below the newer smooth uh, power attachment with a um, Rheostat that mounts up front where you can just set it with your hand. The uh, e-motion power assist that you push input onto the wheels and it uh, follows your direction. And then a power base that you can dock your power, your manual wheelchair into and operate it like a uh, regular power wheelchair for the time that you're docked. And moving forward, I believe we have some other of uh, some of my favorite uh, kind of devices. These are all things that, that I use. Um, the free wheel uh, manual uh, wheelchair attachment on the upper left is quite dynamic. And by, by uh, standards of anything that says handicapped on it is, is still pretty, um, pretty affordable at about $600. Um, I got one early on, I use it constantly. Um, it, it attaches to the front end to keep the 
the um, usually nimble in the house, nimble uh, front casters from catching on everything outside, I've actually been able to push up a loose gravel hill in the manual chair using the, uh, the off-road device. Uh, so very, very helpful. Uh, the uh, lap stacker is a really new product on the upper right. It's uh, $239 US. It's a product of a, uh, an inventive uh, para in New Zealand. And uh, they ship them right out of New Zealand or drop ship them from China where they're constructed, but they work really well. It's, it's essentially a, a little uh, retractable seat belt device where the uh, receivers of the belts mount on the underside of your chair on either side. You can quickly reach down and pull it up and strap it over anything that you have on your lap so you don't drop it all down the curb. The uh, rubberized uh, lap board you see there, I use it every single day, if not in the kitchen, maybe somewhere else, because I'll lay that on my lap, pull the lap stacker over it to secure it, and fill it full of uh, clean dishes over by the disher, dishwasher to take over to the base cabinet rollout uh, drawers to put away dishes, and it works really well. I have not yet gotten in trouble by dropping a whole whole tray full of uh, dishes and breaking them on the ground. I, I know I would get in touch if I did that. So I like uh, having my lap stacker on there so I don't dump everything. Hopefully that trend continues for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wifey would uh, give me a, a very hard time if I dropped a whole plate of <laughs> a whole tray full of glassware on the floor. Then I've got to sit there, right? I'm going to sit there while she sweeps it all around because I ain't go anywhere. I'm going to puncture all my tires. So, um, <laughs> Uh, my my uh, fanny bag illustration there, or my man bag, um, I leave strapped to the uh, right front corner of my chair at all times. A um, couple of things I like for that is when, when I am going to fly, um, I'll just remove it from the chair as I'm uh, getting ready to go through um, uh, TSA security, take the whole thing, throw it through the uh, x-ray machine, on the other side, when I get it back, I straighten out the straps for the longer uh, regular fanny strap, fanny pack straps, and then I wear it. So now my phone, my wallet, my keys, all the belongings, some extra catheters, everything I need for that trip, um, other than a, than a carry-on, might be bigger stuff in a carry-on bag, it's right there in that one pack. It's always where I need it. So um, those are some of my favorite um, parrot tools for my uh, for my use. What exciting equipment do we uh, have next here? Jump in here and uh, talk about a little bit of the really low tech items I have used. Um, I don't know if everyone can see, uh, zip ties are very handy. They just now hold things together. They allow you to hold things. I literally have two zip ties on my cell phone that allows me to hold things. I used to use key rings, but for some reason, the key ring and the combination that I had kept breaking and um, me with a broken key ring doesn't allow me to functionally use my phone. Is that so, a specific um, phone case you have to be able to do that? Nope, I have a standard phone case that I put a hole in to. You, know, you have to do what you have to do. It yeah, still exactly. protects the case but allows me to be more functional. Um, as far as key rings, you would never imagine how convenient it is to just put a key ring in a sweater and it allows you to open and close your sweater. You can put it on your backpack, put it on the zippers and it allows you to that, do that. Velcro is another thing. A lot of quads kind of just put it on their armrest and they put their phone on there and it allows it to stay in place so that you can use it without fear of it falling. So there's are just um, a few examples of really low tech. You're only limited by, you know, your imagination. You yeah, carabiners really... as well. Carabiners yeah, carabiners are, are huge, definitely. Yeah, because I use uh, those rings you're speaking of um, myself on my man bag, um, Jose, and, and then my carabiner clicks my keys, locks my keys onto, onto the bag. Um, so I always know where my uh, keys are. But like I was saying, like, you know, you're only limited by your imagination. You know, That's right. Uh, accessibility can be as simple as a ribbon on a balloon. Oh, someone have a phone ringing by any chance? That's mine, sorry. Okay, that's all right. 
Um, and now, Bill, want to go through? So, um, yeah, let's let's start off. Uh, uh, anybody, of, as they say, of a certain age is going to be well familiar with uh, David Letterman's uh, uh, old <laughs> format of uh, top 10 list of, uh, in this case, everything you wanted to know about spinal cord injury, but might have been afraid to ask or didn't know about until today. So we're going to go back and forth with these. You know, I'd like to start off and say, uh, and, and, I, and I relay this to people that I'm speaking with on the phone in a newer injury kind of a scenario, it gets better. It gets better over time. And I try to break up time into some, some understandable short chunks because when you first get back from the hospital, you need everything. Your house is not squared away yet. You, you're barely used to the uh, wheelchair that you have. You, um, you, you, know, the, you don't have any of these solutions in place yet. However, if you, if you look at time month by month and you set about solving problem number one first, then problem number two, pretty soon I encourage people to look back you know, at a six month point and say, you know what, really got a few things together now. I, I can see myself making progress. It absolutely gets better over time. Jose? Um, number nine, inpatient acute spinal cord injury specific rehab is key to later success. Uh, I went to one of the model systems here in New York City and it makes a world of difference. You would never imagine um, how much it did. Uh, I've met individuals who, 10 years post-injury didn't even know how to catheterize. So having the proper you know, instruction initially, it lays out the foundation of your later success. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 I want to ditto that as well. We get calls and, and, and emailed cases routinely every day from people who did not have the, uh, the opportunity, I almost used the word luxury, but it shouldn't be a luxury, that, that, that had the uh, opportunity to go to an appropriate spinal cord injury specific rehab like Jose did at Mount Sinai and I was able to, to do in Western Pennsylvania and, get, and build that foundation for success. Um, number eight, I'd like to address always include the family. You know, I think it's really important for clinicians and social workers and every program leader or, or a contact person that's dealing with the person or the family after a spinal cord injury. The, a spinal cord injury in, involves the entire family. It affects the entire family. I was very fortunate back in the day when I was injured that I didn't have to wait for my family to be included by the clinicians because I had a very forward uh, type of family who inserted themselves at every opportunity. And you know what? It made a huge difference for me. When I, when I came up for air and realized where I was and I got home, you know, my family were part of the team that made that happen. Jose? Um, connect with United Spinal Association for ongoing support and guidance. As you can see, we're here, we're, you know, giving you this presentation as an extension of that connecting with United Spinal. You know, if, Peer, like I said earlier, peer mentorship is definitely key to later success as well. And United Spinal has been there for over 40 or 75 years. Sorry, I almost messed that up. Um, we've been around for 75 years, you know, in uh, giving you advice and uh, forming resources and putting them together to uh, allow you to ask us questions. You know, Bill is the director of the Resource Center. I work with the Resource Center. We have 48 chapters, which I believe it's, it might be a little off, might be more now, and 58,000 members across the country. So, you know, we have a, vi a vast reach and connecting with us um, will definitely help in your progress. I really just want to second that. Um, obviously, I always put the caveat to also connect with Health Hope Live. But in that conjunction, I connect with United Spinal and Bill can attest this because he's usually my email at least once a week. And I can say that connecting with United Spinal is so critical because they offer so many resources and are available and willing to go above and beyond to find the resource you're asking for. So that is something I really appreciate as someone trying to get resources for our health public clients. And yeah, go ahead. I was gonna, you know, 
put Bill on the spot and <laughs> talk a little bit about the case that you worked in Maine and how connecting with United Spinal saved someone's life. Absolutely. It was a, it was a, you know, at first glance, when we previewed the cases in the morning, it was a, uh, someone joining membership, like, like we have um, 10 or 20 new membership cases every morning. And, 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 and when one joins, by the way, everybody here, if they're not already on in the United Spinal membership, please join to get our free monthly um, publications. But it was a mom up in Maine asking for help. Her, uh, her son was uh, injured eight months by that point with a very high level of spinal cord injury and ventilator dependency, living in the ICU for eight months. They had no idea. It was a rural part of Maine. They had, they had little sophisticated um, medical care available. They had no understanding of what somebody like Jose can, can do that they can they can live independently. They can actually work and drive. They had no understanding of that. And um, we needed to forcefully insert ourselves and, and for another six months worked um, sometimes week by week. We had scheduled uh, conference calls week by week until we got this woman's son uh, the ability to get um, inpatient acute rehab at Shepherd Center in Atlanta. And uh, he came back home uh, after that and uh, remains at home now because of the uh, opportunity to get the appropriate rehab in the first place. Um, you know, and it's such an impactful thing to, you know, go from uh, uh, a medical setting where they're basically just keeping them alive. And literally we're telling them, telling the family, think about laying there and hearing, we have no idea how to do anything with ventilators that we have no idea how to, how to wean you. They, they literally didn't. And they were at least honest in that respect. And, um, and when he got down to, to, to Shepard, they, they looked him over really quickly and went, Oh, we can do a lot of stuff for this guy. We didn't even, we weren't even getting, getting a straight story medically. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to apologize because I don't know what happened and I'm going to bring it up. Right. Not a problem, oh, Jose. It was, I mean, amazing listening to Bill's story. So we appreciate that, Bill. Thank you for yeah, sharing. No We're uh, currently working with um, uh, recent Hurricane Ida um, victims who um, previously had spinal cord injuries, and we have a, a program uh, for them. Um, I think it's my turn to um, you, uh, do uh, number six, which is listen. This is pretty much for the clinicians. Listen to the individuals, listen to their goals. Um, goes for uh, voc rehab counselors as well. My very first voc rehab counselor was assigned to me, total zero, no idea. Didn't listen to what I wanted. I thought that there was no benefit to, to be had for me from Pennsylvania State Vocational Rehab because of how bad that first uh, meeting was. Some uh, sometime later, I, I was introduced to um, a, a different, more experienced uh, vocational rehab counselor who happened to also be a paraplegic. We're of the same age uh, category. He knew me, he understood me. You know, he listened to what I said, and um, he he shot me one job opportunity. I always tell him he's batting a thousand because it was this job. <laughs> Jose. Effective bowel and bladder management is expected. Well, I don't know if expected is the appropriate word, but learning to effectively manage your bowel and bladder is key to having a successful you know, career or life in general. You don't want to sit there and worry about you know, bowel accidents or bladder accidents you know, in your day-to-day -day life. You, know, you really want to take care that you follow a regimen and follow the advice of your doctor first and foremost and make sure that you know uh, everything is going on right down there and then you know you make sure that you follow that regimen and a diet because nothing can ruin your day um, worse than having an accident yeah and I'll, I'll, um, I'll uh, jump on board that issue as well and and also to expand upon it just a bit to say, you know, you're not going to you're not going to have a, 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 a understandable routine on day one. 
it does take a little time. You you realize what works by what doesn't work. You know, so when you do have a problem, you realize, oh, let me pay attention. What was I doing? Uh, okay, what was I consuming and when and how was I managing my my bowel routine and my bladder routine? And then, you know, you get it dialed in and, and your bodies are all different. No one can tell you exactly how to do it and then it's going to be perfect because, you know, everybody's bodies are different. So you have to get tuned into your own body and understand what works. A segue into relationships and sexuality, um, which becomes like a wall at first. You know, it, you, you think you think you, you know, some people think you, you can have that. Um, and with a, open communication and a little experimentation, and time and, uh, and an open-minded partner absolutely can. Jose? And um, with that being said, if you're listening and you want to find out more information, you can go to sexuality.sei or sexualitysci.org, you know, to find out more information. But yes, um, relationships and sexuality is definitely another aspect of the you know, spinal cord injury that we need to talk about and make open uh, and how Pope Liv can help you with, um, with other aspects of it um, later, once you actually have, you know, the open mind in those conversations. Um, again, uh, number three is ask and don't assume. Ask first if a person needs your help. Uh, so many times, you know, you're going about your day to day and um, someone just automatically assumes that, you know, they can help you with your bags or help you with a transfer. And that's going to be extremely dangerous. Uh, and it may seem like a person may need help, you know, but they've learned their techniques on how they're doing things. And you either putting your arm on their chair or putting your arm on their shoulder or grabbing any part of that person's body may throw their balance or um, coordination off and may cause that person to miss a transfer. So definitely you would like to uh, ask first before um, uh, providing help. And then, uh, you know, to follow that up, you know, as, if they need help, ask how you can help. I love, uh, I, I, I totally agree, Jose. And I love when someone asks, really, because they're trying to be nice, you know. Um, I'm going to add a story here. I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah, yeah. please do. Please do. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. There's a story of, you know, a good looking guy. You know, he, he he's going down and he's rolling down the, the, the hallway in a, in a mall. And there's a beautiful woman about to go through a door. And he's rushing to that door to open the door for that beautiful woman. And here's this other guy that comes in and runs after the door and opens it before he gets a chance to open it for the beautiful woman. So it was an uh, opportunity he missed to open a door stop, for a very long time and say, hey. Oh, man. And he yeah, didn't need help. So yeah. I'll come back with you with a story. I actually had a guy. We, we, my wife and I were going into a, a, a bar and grill and um, coming from one angle from far across the parking lot. And another fellow who is about equidistant from the front door quite a bit farther from I at the other 45 degree angle coming towards that front door of the establishment. He looked at me and he started like picking up the pace. He was going to race me to the front door to get that door open for me. And I know, you know, that he was just trying to be nice, but the interchange went sort of like this. He, I saw it and I figured, you know, me being me, I, I went in and popped the tires a few more times and I beat him there. And I got the door open before he could get it open for me. And, and he, and he made some kind of a comment about me be, Oh, I'm an independent cuss. Am I, is it? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, well, that, I, I mean, that moves you right into number two of get moving Bill. It, it does. Well, I actually, <laughs> actually nice segue, but I, yeah. I, I meant to get moving in a little bit different way. Yeah. Um, the, the get moving um, is, you know, after your injury and when you start um, being able to make progress, um, some folks make a lot of progress when with their home and environment and what they're going to do later while they're still in rehab. I, I get calls from people or uh, cases from people joining membership, and I look down, oh, they went to such and such rehab. Hmm. 
but I need to call him because their injury was just this year. It was in 2021. I ring them up. Hello, they're in the rehab. They were injured a month ago. They're in rehab right now. Well, that's amazing to, to have somebody have the foresight and the, and the ability to find us right away like that. We don't really have to worry about that person that much. They're already proactive. They're already looking about how to move forward. But, you know, I'm, I'm, ta- I'm going to put this uh, number two bullet in there more for the people who are getting home. And uh, now there's nothing. And now it gets to be too easy to settle into a routine. You might have been a really super busy person before. I mean, I was working 60 hours a week. I'm moving, moving, moving. Three young kids, but working 60 hours a week, boom, I get hurt. So when things were moving until I got home and then I wife had to go to work, kids are in school, there's like, there's nothing. Yeah, you know, I, getting that person moving is key. And I, I mean, to piggyback off of that, that's something that we at Help Hope Live really, uh, I can't find the word, but we really promote strongly as well, because right at that point of injury, when you're talking to those people that are calling you from rehab, we want them to be calling us as well to start that fundraising so they don't go home to nothing. It's you really have to get moving as early as possible in your fundraising, in finding your finite, your resources for everything that you need for this life that you will be living once you leave rehab. Yeah, that's a definite, you know, um, it is definitely too easy to sit back and allow everyone as the high level quality, I'm speaking myself, too easy to sit back and allow everyone else to do things for you instead of trying to do them yourself. And that, you know, goes back to staying connected with Help Hope Live and United Spinal, you know, as part of that getting moving for, um, get moving process. So Bill, um, I know that you have a few stories that you want to. So, uh, so, you know, I think, I think that it's important to, to inject humor whenever you can. I mean, there were some, I had some humorous pitfalls that I'm not going to expound upon. And you get to that point, you look, my wife and I are looking at you, you know, you just have to laugh because like, you know, why, why wouldn't you just then get on, on with it? But a couple of notables, I had two, I had two really uh, notable um, escalator accidents. Now we're talking about, don't recommend anybody to do this. I <laughs> would not recommend anybody to do this, but back in the day, <laughs> I, I did. So I, I was, uh, I got into hand cycling pretty deeply. And I, I ended up doing 11 different um, uh, marathons over a few years. And, and I did the Marine Corps marathon six times in DC it was an amazing event, amazing event. And uh, my adult son and I were competing. I had got upgraded my hand cycle. So he was using my own one, uh, my old one. We're, we're riding together as a team. So we're at the uh, DC convention center uh, because 18,000 people run in that event. They needed a big venue in order to pick up our packets the day before the race. So there's a sea of young fit, not all young, a sea of fit individuals, all these runners. And, and I'm going up the escalator frontwards, holding on to the side rails, like probably shouldn't do, but I am. And uh, my sons are with me and we got a crowd of these uh, studs all around. And it's a two floor long, it was of a hundred feet long escalator straight up. It got overloaded, it quit. So I'm halfway up the escalator, it stops. We look at each other, I'm looking around. So we said, okay, you're on my team, you're on my team. Give me a hand, we'll like get my butt up there. Yeah, okay. So I got carried up like um, Cleopatra on a, on a little <laughs> cart there, you know, they just grabbed the four corners of my chair and up the, up the escalator I went. One other one, my daughter and I, and we were a bad combination. We always get into some kind of a melee. Um, it was at the University of Pittsburgh, brutal ice outside, uh, visited a relative in the hospital. We're now trying to get up, back up to where our car's parked, about 300 feet of elevation up, way up this long hill that University of Pittsburgh's mounted on. They call it Cardiac Hill. So we go into, we go into the student union. We're, again, on one of these long escalators. The very first time I've been on an escalator, I don't know what I'm doing. And my, my daughter's saying, why don't you go forward? And I said, no, what if I, what if I just back in like this and then I'll hold on while I backed up too far? And the first step caught me and up we go. 
So she's in front of me now. She's balancing me, and we're going, oh, this is going to look good when we get to the top. I don't know what we're going to do. Well, on a 100-foot-long escalator, the, the stairs run at a different pace than the belts. Oh, yeah. By the time <laughs> I got to the top, I was jacked sideways. It was almost upside down. And instead of it just ejecting me and then I got to get up, I was up at the top with each successive step slapping into me like this. As they were coming up, they're smacking us. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Some some young fraternity brother came along, he had his headphones in, never said a word, big stud <laughs> guy. He walks over, snatches me, sticks me in my chair and keeps on walking. We never even talked. <laughs> and I'm thinking later on, he's he's with his fraternity brother saying, You can't believe what I saw yeah. today. This guy, you know, and everything. So I mean so you gotta just, laugh. He, yeah, you just started our next top 10 list for our next presentation. Yeah, there you go. Things that Bill should Fails. not have maybe done at one point. Yeah, but things that Bill failed yeah. at. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to add one. Um, it, it's shorter. Yeah. So, me and my brother, we always get into some hijinks. And we were, I, I needed to get into the car. And I was like, all right. Uh, it's only 20 feet from or 12, 15 yards from the front of the house to the vehicle. And instead of transferring into the chair, rolling to the vehicle and then transferring in, we're like, all right, you know, you grab one arm, one leg, you grab one arm, one leg. And we just roll a uh, stroll to the vehicle. Well, that happened. They picked me up and started walking <laughs> towards the vehicle. And now we started laughing because they're getting tired. Oh, no. <laughs> And midway, he was like, stop laughing. Uh, I can't hold you up. And now the other one starts laughing. <laughs> and they're slowly getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And that vehicle <laughs> starts getting lower and lower in the horizon. And then I'm laying on the on flat on the ground. <laughs> so while I'm laying there, we almost made it, by, mind you. Um, almost, yeah. <laughs> while I'm laying there, I'm like, you know, should I change the oil while I'm sitting there? And we're just all sitting there laughing and laughing and laughing. So we definitely do things that we shouldn't. And as long as I don't think any good about. story starts with me and my brother tried to, and then yeah. that's, <laughs> that's always going to be another top 10 list. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So. Those are great. Thank you guys. This was such a great list. Absolutely. A couple of uh, more low tech devices. Um, the uh, pedal masters upper left, uh, I would offer a word of caution. If, if you really want to do the, the low cost, uh, do that, call me. I'll talk to you about the pitfalls of them. They can be, I, I, they were my first hand controls. They can be very dangerous. They're easy to fix, but I don't recommend people just grab something they're unfamiliar with. There are a variety of different types of controls out there, but I think the best thing you can do is ask questions of your DME provider and uh, make sure you learn how all the things work with the, the good points of them and certainly what the bad points of them are before you get into a trick. So you wanna go on to the next? Yeah. Uh, let's see if this will play. What I do getting in my van is I pull up, lock my brakes in the driver's door area, then this is really important. I place the arch of my right foot carefully against the door panel so that it'll stay there and help propel, propel me inward. Then I get my right hip over by the driver's uh, seat. Pull on the, on the uh, steering wheel and I pop in there. It's important that your first move is forward, freeing up your knees so that you can slide right in. And what I'll, what I'll point out, the reason Another I just, well, let's watch this one first. Arch to the foot, get my hip over there, pull on the steering wheel, pop in, end up facing outward, facing your chair, take off your brakes, turn it around backwards and reach around the doorpost, grab the chair, secure a grip on the base of the driver's seat, Pull the chair inward, and it rolls over the rear wheels right inside your van, and you're ready to go. That maneuver right there saved me $30,000 twice on standard vans to be able to just jump up in there 
uh, versus, um, you know, for a para, if you're going to be able to do that thing, a, a younger guy showed me the technique and, and, and everything. And it uh, really saved me, you know, saved me a lot of money and it, it allowed me to do things on a low tech um, method. But for hey. those who need a high tech. You need a ramp fan, then you need a ramp fan. <laughs> Right. And you need to contact uh, help, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. There we Definitely go. Do. And I think, Jose, you have a video of that, too. I am, but or, I'm going to, we'll get to it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh we this have some more here. Bill, yeah. They'll transferring out. When I get oh. out of my van. We're going to let you get out of the car first, Bill. A little bit simpler. I get out quicker than I get in. Facing out. Open the door. Snap your chair. Start rolling it out. And I work my hands back to the rear bar of the chair so it doesn't roll away. Flip it around. I only lost the chair yeah, once. Close, put my brakes across on. the parking line. I had to get back in and go over and drive up to it. Me to uh, put my right, put my foot squarely on the uh, integral foot plate. It's like leaving a car in neutral. <laughs> Reach to the far I've done it. frame section and pop out. <laughs> We have one more demonstration. There's one Hattie more Jones. demonstration, which is of the um, Beagle Compact 2 hand controls. The Beagle Compact 2 hand controls are push to brake, pull back for accelerate, and you can lock them forward for a parking brake. Pull for throttle, push for brake, very intuitive, and you can push the buttons and lock it as a parking brake. I love that. Uh, it's it's totally out of your way. Uh, ambulatory drivers can jump in there. My wife can jump in there without cool. the un, under uh, under steering wheel um, controls whacking her in the knees or not having enough space on the pedals. They're a very intuitive uh, tool. And it, for the other ones, they have to lock out your steering column so it doesn't you know adjust anymore. And the new airbags prevent the old style uh, systems from working, Jose. All right, so this is for drivers like myself who needs really high tech um, equipment. Um, what you have in the top right hand corner is um, a system uh, called the DigiDrive. It's a little steering wheel that allows you to literally fly by wire. You turn that little wheel and it turns your steering wheel. And it's usually in combination with an electronic box that does the gas and brake. So it's called the EGB, electronic gas and brake. And this is a system by AVET, by AMC, EMC. Um, and you could do your secondary controls using that little screen. On the bottom right-hand corner, you have this thing that looks like a little joystick. It literally is. It allows you to drive your van just like you drive your power chair, you know, but it's in reverse. Uh, gas is backwards, brake is forward, and then you have left and right. This is the system that I actually use. It's called the Scott Driving System. Um, the vehicle I learned in was a 1993 Econoline van that had no steering wheel similar to the picture here. Uh, wow. And the top right-hand corner is a tri-pin that allows you to put your hand in, you rotate, and you can steer. And the bottom is the panel with the secondary controls, which you'll see in the video. Getting into my modified vehicle is fairly simple. I double press one of the buttons on the key fob, door opens, ramp is deployed. I drive from my wheelchair, so there's an easy lock where I can slide in and lock into place. What you see here is my secondary controls. This allows me to shift gears, open and close windows, and control the radio, and do everything. So here you see me placing my hand into what I use to control the vehicle. I rotate it right to steer right, and left to steer left. Forward is gas, and back is brake. Now let's go for a drive.
And I'm going to say, you know, for those who are injured and want to drive, depending on your level and how much assistance you need, it can be extremely expensive. Um, my modifications were $120,000 without the purchase of the vehicle. So I'm practically driving a Lamborghini when I'm down on the road. You know, it's a $150,000 vehicle. And you're not going to be able to afford that. You're going to need organizations like Help Hope Live to pay for these things because it is extremely expensive. Even Bill's modifications, uh, his hand controls are $2,000. And that's not including if you need a six-way seat or a lowered floor minivan. You know, you can run a bill at $75,000 easily. Easily, easily. And we help clients almost every other week fundraise. I mean, we are, we're helping them fundraise throughout the years, but we are helping clients purchase almost every other week vans, whether they're used or new or whatever modifications they need. We, we're seeing quite an uptick, especially in this last year when the road trip is making such an, a resurgence since no one can really get out and travel like we're used to. So definitely some vans are a huge item that we help our clients fundraise toward. Absolutely. That's and perfect. that leads us into our next slide, which is, you know, perfect. Hey. How Pope live. So, yeah. So, I mean, all of the equipment that Jose and Bill spoke about today, we could help you fundraise toward. We set you up with a campaign page on our website, a one-on-one -on -one client services coordinator, and give you all of the tools and the support necessary to go into your community to fundraise in a safe and reliable and supportive manner. All of the funds that are raised are raised for Help Hope Live in your honor and are managed by Help Hope Live, so they should not affect any of your asset-based benefits or become taxable income to you. And then you send these bills to us and we help pay these bills directly to the vendor. And we're here with you for your entire lifetime, which as we mentioned before, we want you to get moving. We want you to contact us as early as possible after your injury, after your diagnosis that may leave you paralyzed so that we can help you start fundraising right away. Because not every expense is going to be a $70,000 van. You may still have some everyday and more inexpensive expenses, but we can still help you fundraise for those. Just because you might not need that big ticket item right now we're still here to help you live a more independent life, whatever that looks like for you. So yeah. by all means, I think, uh, sorry, Jose, did you have something to add to that? Or? Well, I do want to add, um, there's other fundraising options out there, but they definitely do affect your medical coverage. In my instance, I can't have more than $2,000 in assets in the bank. And if you go and fundraise all over a different platform, one, they take 7%. Two, they count as assets and countable income towards you. And for a person like myself who needs 24 hour home care, I need my medical insurance. And if you go and do a campaign through one of those other services, you're more, select, more likely gonna end up in a world of hurt um, better in a, than in a better position. So definitely look yeah. for organization, an organization like Hope Hope Live, if not, I mean, it, Contact yeah. help hopefully. Yeah, well, that leads, I think, to our next slide where we have some contact information. Um, by all means, reach out to us for anything that you may have questions on. Our 800 number, our website. You can speak to anyone on our staff Monday through Friday. We're here to help answer your questions. And speaking of questions, we before I get to the two questions we do have, I again just want to say thank you to Bill and Jose and really the entire United Spinal Association team. We partner with United Spinal on many different levels throughout the year. And I just was reminded too, as I saw a message come through in the chat, that we have individuals from United Spinal on some of our committees. We have we are working with United Spinal on some gaming information. We're working with United Spinal on a podcast interview that I did. So we love you guys and we work with you guys all the time and we just appreciate all of the resources that you help our clients with as well. So I, like I said, we do have two questions real quick um, as we are entering our hour because this was such a full presentation of so many specific and so much specific information, which I really appreciate. I think Bill and probably Jose too, 
Bill, especially with fielding all of the resource questions that you do get, do you think that there's any question out there in the world that maybe people aren't asking that there, you know, there might be a lot of common trends you're seeing, but is there something that you think that people ought to know or that you would wish they would ask more of, or maybe as your top 10 list suggested, maybe they're too afraid to ask? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll respond uh, with, with, with two snippets. Um, first of all, the newer, the injured individ individual in their family, because they are a team, ideally, um, the, the newer they are to the spinal cord injury game, they often are uh, in the, well, always at the beginning, they're in a scenario where they don't know what they don't know yet. Yeah. So we'll get relatively innocuous looking memberships um, with no real questions in them. Yeah. And then look at the year of injury, it's 2001. Oh, well, we'll be able to help them with a lot of stuff as soon as we get them on the phone, but they don't know what to ask yet. So, yeah. you know, questions change over time. And today's questions are, you know, immediate injury, you're in ICU, you need to find out where the best rehab opportunity is once you're in rehab you need to get the house renovated once you get into the house well how am i going to take care of my ongoing care when you get when you get that lined up how can i move forward learn how to drive and maybe get back to work so that's one kind of a thing and the other thing is sometimes uh people are maybe a little us americans are a little timid to ask some of the questions we want to ask and maybe you know they're not feeling comfortable asking yet about intimacy and relationships and you know um i'll just make a quick blur of our, our our six member information specialist team four of us uh, live with spinal cord injuries and of the four of us we have a combined 100 years of living with spinal cord injuries so between the four of us we've pretty much been there done that and 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 asked those questions ourselves and learned them um, we do still learn from people every day. You know, um, the job is great because anything brand new or somebody has a, a new way to do something, it comes right across our desks. So that's great. So I think, you know, people not knowing what they don't know yet and uh, just maybe be intimate about asking what they really want to know. You know, those are kind of things that, uh, you know, we welcome. Absolutely. Um, and I don't know, Jose, did you have anything to add? Or we have one other question. No, he pretty much covered it. It's usually yeah. the question not at, um, asked that is the yeah. one that's the most important sometimes. So we did have one question from an attendee who is the parent of a child who had a surgical spinal cord injury in late 2017. And at the time, their priority was his spinal cord tumor. But now they wonder if there's still a role for spinal cord injury specific rehab. Would you have any recommendations for how to approach this question? And they said at this point, most of his day-to-day -day issues are strictly spinal cord injury related. So is there still a role? Should they still be seeking out rehab? You know, uh, so go ahead. I'm going to start that. because I was injured young. I was injured at 15 and... Um, there's always going to be a role for um, rehab. You know, your son or your child is young and his body's always going to be changing. However, on that same token, you need to consider quality of life and progress. If I would have been chasing the physical therapy for a cure, I would not have finished high school, gone to college, and have developed a career with United Spinal Association. So while you're doing the physical therapy, keep in mind, you know, um, school and making a progress. And Bill, did you have something to add to that? I was gonna add to that, that there are a couple of uh, second chance rehab programs around the country that we can introduce uh, people to um, when things have changed or they haven't been in rehab for a long time and they have a need um, there, there are programs there to readdress that need sort of similar to when you had your initial inpatient acute. So there's a lot of those available. And, um, you know, just reach out, uh, just answering a couple of texts uh, here, people's questions, reach out to us at ask us, ask us 
at unitedspinal.org. And that comes right into our case management system. And we'll get your, get your um, question later today or look at it first thing tomorrow morning. Ask us at unitedspinal.org. And uh, one of us with uh, some wicked long time uh, chair time or uh, our uh, social worker or um, spinal cord injury rehab nurse will uh, take your question um, seriously and reach out to you and find, help you find a solution. Absolutely. And with that, and I do apologize if there are any questions we weren't able to get to. I saw one specifically about gaming and I will address that in an email afterwards, honestly, because we, I work very closely with the gaming access, the access tech initiative program with United Spinal. So we can certainly um, answer that question at, after this presentation, now that we fit our, or Jose, you can also obviously, up, yeah, Jose I'm can answer gamer. that. Yeah, Jose is a gamer, so I don't know. We have a few minutes. I mean, do you want to just, is there anything lightly that you want to touch on gaming? Any specific question or just it was overall? It was simply, let me bring it back up. There was something, doo, 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 doo. it was, my question is about gaming accessibility, web-based. My mom cannot move and does not have any coordinated movements. Um, uh, That one, you have to try things out, you know. Uh, some of the input devices that were shown earlier in the um, presentation might help your mother access some of those web features or, you know, the input devices that will help her click here, click there. And they're usually simpler games. So turn-based games or card games, you know, those are the ones that she uh, more likely going to be able to play, but she will be able to play. It's, you're only limited by your imagination. Absolutely. And we will, just to follow up with that, we will have a recording of this presentation going out tomorrow. So you guys will all have this presentation. You'll be able to see the equipment and get reminded of the equipment that they had spoken about. Um, and we are, like I said, we are working with the Access Tech Initiative to come up with some easy pamphlets about accessible gaming so that this can go more out and get that community more involved. Um, so again, I just... In consideration of time, we will have a follow-up e-blast. We will most likely have a follow-up blog on our website as well. We can address anything we might have missed there. But I really, really just want to say thank you to Bill and Jose as part of September being Spinal Cord Injury Awareness Month to be here with our Hope Talk this year. Um, and, you know, all that United Spinal does. So Help Hope Live really appreciates your work. And thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you both. Thank, Thank you, Sonny, you. for inviting us. Anytime. All right. Thank you, guys, and have a great day.